One of the most important ways in which poetic language differs from the language of prose is in its use of imagery. Poetry is holistic language. Unlike conceptual or analytical language, poetry does not separate thought from emotion, sound from meaning, or ideas from the physical body. Poetic language is experiential. It tries to convey experience with the fullness and immediacy we actually feel in our lives. Writers often use imagery in analytical prose, but it tends to be used in a secondary way. Usually, the imagery is there to illustrate a conceptual point that the writer is making. But in poetry, imagery has a different and more important role. Imagery doesn't just illustrate meaning. Imagery becomes meaning. Now, what is an image? An image is a word or phrase that directly presents a sensory experience, usually sight, but sometimes sound, touch, taste, or smell. Poetic language gives the image an independence and authority that ordinary prose or everyday speech does not. Poetry recognizes the power of images to work directly on our imagination and physical senses, our intuition and memory to communicate meaning. Everyday prose usually feels the need to control images, to make sure that they are not being misunderstood, but used clearly to illustrate the idea the writer is trying to communicate. The prose method is not inferior to the poetic method, but it is fundamentally different. If you want to be a poet or reader of poetry, it is essential to understand that difference. Let's look at a couple of simple examples. Here is a prose sentence. In Los Angeles, it is usually quicker to take the metro than a bus. You have two images here, the metro and the bus, but they aren't a specific bus or a specific metro car. They are abstractions of the things. In the same way, if you say, I like fruit, especially oranges, you're making a sort of a general statement about a general orange on a general person. But if you say, let's eat that big, sweet, juicy orange, you are using the image in a fundamentally different way. You're evoking the sense of taste, of sight, uh, in a way that brings you to that sweet, juicy orange, not just any orange. In poetry, imagery is usually more tangible and less abstract, more specific and less general, more present and less remote than it would be in an equivalent prose passage. The purpose of poetic imagery is usually to make you feel the physical presence of the thing. Here are the first two stanzas of Theodore Retke's famous poem, My Papa's Waltz. The whiskey on your breath could make a small boy dizzy, but I hung on like death. Such waltzing was not easy. We romped until the pans slid from the kitchen shelf, my mother's countenance could not unfrown itself. How many images are in these eight lines? At least eight. There is the drunken father, the smell of whiskey on his breath, the little boy, the image of the boy hanging on, the couple romping, the pans sliding from the shelf, the waltz itself, 
and the mother's frowning face. Retke's imagery brings us directly into the scene, the sights, the mother frowning, the sounds, the, the noise of the waltz, the smells, the whiskey on your breath, the tactile feeling, the little boy hanging on like death. Retke uses these to evoke a particular scene in which you physically feel yourself present. Poetry communicates holistically, and much of the communication is physical and sensory. Imagery communicates directly to our five senses without an intermediary idea. That is the key thing to remember about images. Imagery is primarily thought of as visual, but it can be auditory, olfactory, tactile, or gustatory. But it is direct, and it does not have an idea filtering it into a general perception. What an image does is to unleash physical intelligence, memory, imagination, intuition, rather than appeal to rational thought. At least initially, we can go back and rationally analyze how the poem works, but that is not how we experience it directly. Now let's examine another poem that consists entirely of imagery. It's a short lyric poem by T.S. Eliot that describes a seemingly ordinary urban moment. But as we read it, let's ask ourselves, what is the poem trying to communicate? First, literally, and then associationally. It has certain denotations. It describes a scene rather exactly, but it also suggests through connotation a larger meaning. There seems to be a difference between what it says literally and what it suggests in broader sense. It is one of T.S. Eliot's preludes, and it goes by the title of its first line, The Winter Evening Settles Down. The winter evening settles down with smell of stakes and passageways. Six o'clock, the burnt out ends of smoky days, and now a gusty shower wraps the grimy scraps of withered leaves about your feet and newspapers from vacant lots. The showers beat on broken blinds and chimney pots. And at the corner of the street, a lonely cab horse steams and stamps. And then, the lighting of the lamps. Now, this poem speaks almost entirely through its images. The images describe a physical scene, but the speaker makes no general statements about it his personal condition or the broader human condition. And yet, as we experience the poem, the connotations and the associations of these direct physical images build in our imagination a sense of precisely those things which are not being said. Now, when does the poem take place? We know from the very first line that it is winter. We know that it's getting dark, and in a couple of lines, we learn that it's precisely six o'clock, the moment that darkness falls, and the sense of darkness is intensified by the rain and the cold. In the course of the poem, we have a tactile, olfactory, visual, and auditory images. We have the smell of stakes in passageways. We have the feeling of the cold. You know, we have the images of, of the, the rain, of grimy scraps, of leaves, of newspapers. 
we have the auditory image of the showers beating on broken blinds and chimney pots. And then the poem ends with a kind of stunning visual image. In this dark, cold, rainy night, there is the sudden lighting of the street lamps, a sudden change in the visual universe of the poem. Uh, this is an interesting poem because it shows you how much a poet can communicate by giving direct images without saying anything more. The particular power of imagery comes from its ability to bypass the analytical part of the mind and present itself directly to the senses. Now, we experience uh, this kind of language every day in something we call advertising. Now think of uh, if advertising was trying to communicate in general conceptual language. They would say, eat bacon, it tastes good. Instead, what they do is they show you bacon cooking on a grill in a way that evokes the scent and the taste of bacon. They know that is a more powerful way of communicating the thing itself. Or if there was an advertisement that simply said, drink beer. Instead, they show a shot of a cold beer being poured into a glass with its foam rising. They know that that physical image evokes much more appetite for beer than the abstract statement. Or think of it in terms of journalism, political journalism. You could have a headline that says, war is bad, but it's if you show an atrocity of war, the photograph of the suffering and destruction that it causes, the viewer has a visceral reaction more powerful than what the abstract statement could give you. Imagery has always been important to poetry. Uh, you find imagery through poetry in pretty much every culture, in every age. But in the modern period, imagery became central to the style that writers adopted. Many poets felt that imagery gave them a particular power to jump over the rational mind with its powerful but conventional ways of understanding the world. Most of us have a kind of set framework by which we judge experience. The poet is trying, in a sense, to bypass that and get directly into our imagination, our memory, our physical bodies. But if you let the image speak to the unconscious mind, it unlocks memories, instincts, desires, and fears that most people don't want to summon into their everyday consciousness. The power and origins of imagery also became a central part of the study of psychology. Sigmund Freud analyzed the images that his patients used to describe their lives and problems. He believed that imagery was the way in which the unconscious mind revealed its secrets. Freud's student Carl Jung developed the idea of imagery even further. Jung presented a theory of archetypal imagery, universal ways in which a collective unconscious communicated primal experiences common to the human race. Jung believed that the entire human race shared certain instinctive responses expressed by a small set of common archetypal images, such as fire or flood, the shadow, the wise old man. Jung believed these archetypes reflected experience so early and so deeply rooted in human history that they were actually hardwired into the human mind. Now, Jung may have been thinking more like a poet than a scientist, 
But his conviction that images carried primal energy has a relevance to how all literature works. But now, let's turn to the important role that imagery has played in the history of poetry, especially modern poetry. Poetry originated in song. Ancient poetry was an auditory, performative art, sung or chanted by a bard or shaman in the physical presence of an audience. The text, the words of the poem, were heard, not seen. There was, in fact, originally no written text of a poem. It was performative. Even after the invention of writing, poetry remained primarily a musical art whose energy and power was mostly auditory. A poem could be experienced on the written page, but it was still something that was conceived of primarily as an auditory shape. But with the rise of printed books and mechanical typography in the Renaissance, poetry became a more visual art. The printed text was easier to read than a handwritten manuscript. The visual presence of the text increased, and the image began to play a more important role in the art. In fact, the first major school of modernist English poetry focused on the visual possibilities of the typographic text, and they called themselves the imagists to announce their new allegiances. The group of poets was led by Ezra Pound, who was the most influential early modernist poet in the English language. Pound was a great poet, essayist, editor, and catalytic personality. He was also the first great theorist of modernism in English. Pound and the imagists were fascinated by the notion of creating a new kind of poetry based on sight more than sound, driven by spatial rather than temporal concerns. Music consists of sounds moving through time. It has a temporal organization. But visual art uh, consists of expressive images filling a defined space, a framed space. It is a spatial art. When a song is over, it ceases to exist in its temporal medium. But words on a page, like a painting on a wall, can hold meaning outside time. They can even be grasped in different temporal orders. Let's look at a famous, short, early modernist poem by Ezra Pound. It is a tiny poem, only three lines of typography, and one of those lines is the title. It was written in 1916, and it is called In a Station of the Metro. The apparition of these faces in the crowd petals on a wet black bow. Each line has a separate semantic identity, complete and independent in itself. The title describes a place in a station of the metro, which suggests that it is in Paris. The first line of text is simply an image of motion, the apparition of these faces in, in the crowd. And the second line of text seems to be unrelated to everything that's come before it. It presents another image that it simply offers without any explanation in relationship to the title and to the first line. The poem is not easily comprehended the first time one reads it. The eye naturally uh, skips up and down trying to figure out the connections within this spatial organization, this vertical arrangement of three visual images. Pound's poem is very much like a haiku, uh, 
another form that came into English around the same time. The haiku, which is one of the great Japanese forms of poetry, consists of 17 syllables, usually linking two images. The notion of having images denote the meaning is fundamental to most Japanese poetry. Here, for example, is one of the great masters of the haiku in Japanese, Tanaguchi Buson. This was written in the 18th century. There's no title in the original. The piercing chill I feel, my dead wife's comb in our bedroom, under my heel. The piercing chill I feel, is the first image, it's tactile, uh, and it's related to a combination sort of tactile and visual image. My dead wife's comb in our bedroom, under my heel. Now let's go to a, a modern American version of this. Here is a poem by Lee Gerga. The title is the first line, as it is in pound, Visitor's Room. Everything bolted down, except my brother. This is a, a poem which once again suggests a great deal more than it says explicitly. Visitor's room, everything bolted down, except my brother. The sudden shift in poetry into visual organization leads to many of the key developments of modern poetry, and it ultimately divides poetry into different aesthetic classes. Uh, and you see this across the modern arts. There are the visual arts, painting, sculpture, architecture, photography, versus the temporal arts, music, dance, poetry, movies. And you see poetry as it were, moving from the temporal arts into the visual arts. It fundamentally changes the way a poem is organized and communicates. Let's end by looking at two short poems uh, which use this notion of a visual image uh, to basically build its meaning without explicitly saying it. The first poem is by Wallace Stevens. It's called Disillusionment of Ten O'Clock. The houses are haunted by white nightgowns. None are green or purple with green rings or green with yellow rings or yellow with blue rings. None of them are strange with socks of lace and beaded centaurs. People are not going to dream of baboons and periwinkles. Only here or there, an old sailor, drunk and asleep in his boots, catches tigers in red weather. That is a poem which I think for most people, when they first read it, they're not really sure what it's about. Although, when you look at it, it is quite explicit and clear as to what it describes. The problem readers have is they're not quite sure what the description means. The meaning of this poem is largely in the associations that this welter of images creates. Now, this is an entirely visual poem. It has eight colors mentioned in the first six lines. There are no metaphors. There are no similes. The poetic energy is generated by the images without any kind of general explanation of why the images are being offered. Now, what is the setting of this poem? We know that it's in houses around 10 o'clock. We presume 10 o'clock in the evening as people are dressing for bed, but it doesn't explain it any more than that. Now, from what we know of Wallace Stevens's life, we can say, well, this perhaps describes uh, 
his feelings in some ways of having gone from New York City to Hartford, Connecticut, and seeing the kind of slow pace of the suburbs. But it goes well beyond any autobiographical explanation. We see haunted houses, and we ask the question, who's haunting them? Well, they seem to be haunted by the living. Once again, it's a visual image of a person in a nightgown, largely resembling the traditional image of a ghost. And what we see is the contrast between the white nightgowns that are being worn and all of the purple, green, yellow, and blue nightgowns that they might have worn. The poem also uh, goes into essentially two sections. You have this long catalog of the various nightgowns that are not being worn. Uh, it's interesting. It gives images that are not present into the last four lines when suddenly the poem shifts with this image of a drunken sailor asleep in his boots, dreaming of catching tigers in red weather. So what it resembles in a way is a kind of elaborate and extended haiku. But the key thing to pay attention to is that Stevens achieves these memorable, powerful, and kind of haunting effects entirely through images without the use of any conceptual statements. Now, let's end with just a quick look at a, a famous contemporary poem by Stevie Smith. It is, in fact, her most famous poem. And we really don't have to look at anything more than the title to see the power of the image, which is not waving, but drowning. Nobody heard him, the dead man, but still he lay moaning. I was much further out than you thought, and not waving, but drowning. Poor chap, he always loved larking, and now he's dead. It must have been too cold for him. His heart gave way, they said. Oh, no, no, no. It was too cold always. Still, the dead one lay moaning. I was much too far out all my life, and not waving, but drowning. Now, there is so much that one can say about this poem, not the least of which is that, in some ways, it seems to be a conversation between living people and the dead person who is uh, still offering a commentary on his life. But I simply want to focus on one thing, the power of the image. We're given an image of a person out at sea with an arm being raised, which is an image which is misunderstood by the people on the shore. They think that he's just fooling around and waving at them, but he's actually signaling for help. In the course of the poem, Stevie Smith does a wonderful thing. She takes this image, this physical image, which is misunderstood and makes it into a symbol for this dead person's entire life, who was always, in a sense, isolated in this cold life and signaling to be rescued. Images generate much of the energy of poetry. They have the power to bypass the rational mind with all of its elaborate filters and speak directly to the physical body, imagination, memory, and unconscious mind. If poetry is a special way of speaking and writing that rewards a special way of listening and reading, then imagery is one of the main ways that poetry achieves its heightened power.